Okay, so at the Anfield Wrap, we're always having conversations about who would we like to interview, who would we like to get on, who would be good value as an Anfield Wrap interview. And, and one of the names that always came up for a long, long time was Peter Crouch. We really thought he'd be good value. He's a laugh on Twitter. You know, we all liked him when he was at Liverpool. Uh, when he left, everyone sort of thought, fair enough, because you'd had Torres and Gerrard joining up and there didn't really seem to be a place for him. So, you know, there was no animosity or anything like that. So for a long time, he was, you know, putting messages out, asking people he knew, asking him directly on Twitter, that kind of thing, and it was never really coming off. But he's got a book out now, and I'm not saying he's only done it because he wants to promote the book. He likes us, he follows us, he's, he's on to the Anfield Have content. So finally he said, yeah, and we got to go along to Waterstones in Liverpool. We got into a little back room there, and we got 20 minutes or so with Peter Crouch. It's already been out there for the people who subscribe to the Anfield Have as a podcast, but we filmed it as well, and we thought he was really good value. We thought it'd be a great watch as a video. So we're in this. Okay, it's an Anfield Rap special. Uh, we're here with Peter Crouch to discuss his new book, How to Be a Footballer. Uh, Peter, I had, a week, I had a weekend of reading this book. I've got through it. Really enjoyed it. It's a good laugh. I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting opposite here. <laughs> Would have been awkward if it was shit. <laughs> uh, but, but, but thankfully it wasn't. Um, I mean, you'd obviously go through right through your career in this book. Um, and I think one of the things that comes through it first off for me is that you're enjoying your football mm-hmm. first and foremost, aren't you? I mean, I've read a lot of footy books and they're very serious and they're going yeah. about tactics of managers and all this. Whereas you seem to have done this and thought, I'm just going to have a bit of a laugh mm-hmm. with it. Well, yeah, it's what I've done throughout my career, really. Like, whenever I've played, I've always tried to enjoy it. And I think um, part of the reason that I wanted to do the, this book is that a lot of people take themselves very seriously, yeah. certainly in the Premier League. And I think these days, no one wants to open up and have a laugh and be seen to sort of doing it with a smile. It's the best job in the world. You know, why don't we enjoy it? And I think um, hopefully, I've, well, I certainly have done that in my career. Definitely enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah, it's nice to get down some of the, some of the stories that, um, that have come with me on the way. So, obviously, we're, we're the Anfield app. We're interested in the, in the Liverpool bit, if you like. Yeah. Um, just, just talk to us about, about when the, the move come about. You're at Southampton, mm. uh, seven million or there about mm. offer comes in from Liverpool. You say in the book that it's it's not straightforward. You you have a bit of a conversation with Harry Redknapp, don't you? And sort of expect that that's yeah. it, and then it isn't. Yeah. It isn't, is it? Yeah, that's right. It's. Uh, I mean, first and foremost, I remember my agent coming to me and saying, like, basically you're sitting down. It's one of those. It's like just gone down going to play championship football and Liverpool just won the Champions League. I watched obviously the Istanbul final, one of the best finals I've ever been seen. And uh, and they're like, you know, Liverpool will come in for you. And I'm like, that's incredible, obviously dying to go. Um, and yeah, uh, the, the Harry was like, yeah, yeah, that's amazing when I told him. And um, so I was like, great. And then I spoke to Rupert Lowe and he was like, no, you're not going anywhere. So I was like, what? So I spoke to Harrison, what's going on? He said, yeah, obviously I'm not going to tell him that. I want you for next season. So um, I, yeah, I couldn't believe it. And in the end, we had to drive down to Rupert Lowe's house in the Cotswolds. And uh, I was banging on his door. He wasn't answering. Uh, and in the end, I had to go round to his garden. He was reading, in the, he was in the newspaper, reading the newspaper in his garden. And I just turned up at his house saying that I want to leave. Um, there was no way that I couldn't, turn, you know, I couldn't turn down or not play for Liverpool, having, having just witnessed what I'd just witnessed, uh, one of the biggest clubs in the world. And obviously, it was a yeah, honour honor to, be, to be signed. And then when you get there, first few sessions and stuff, I mean, there's a few stories that you tell through the book where it kind of comes across to me that you're a bit... Shit, Gerard and Carragher are a mm. bit scary. Yeah. And and in you, I think you say in one of your first sessions, you you miscontrol a ball a bit, and then you just sense that Gerard's just give you this big stare mm. to say, "Are you good enough?" Exactly right. <laughs> yeah. Like because when I was at Southampton, um, yeah, I'd, like, I'd had a really good season and I was comfortable. And it's one of those where I don't know that the, the the sort of lower down you are. Um, maybe things were accepted a little bit. And I, as soon as I got to Liverpool, the, the first thing that I noticed was um, like certainly those two, but you know, Alonso, the, the other players, there was other players there as well that, um, that keep your standards up. But for me, Gerald and Carragher just um, made you set your standards every single day. And I think um, sometimes, yeah, the manager would do that, but if a, you've got a player doing that, um, two players especially, uh, setting the standards every day in training, and like I said, uh, you know, I miscontrolled the first ball, and I m- remember Stevie just giving me the death stare, <laughs> and uh, basically, like you say, just saying, you know, hold on a minute, like, 
you're at Liverpool now, you know, don't, don't let your standards drop, basically. Uh, and then after that, I was just on my toes in every single session. And, uh, and like I said in the book, I was trying to impress them more than I was Rafa at some times. And I think if you've got that at a football club, just breeds, uh, you know, constant success at that, at that high level. Now, we all remember as fans, and I'm sure you do, and you've talked about it in the book, you know, you talk about wanting to impress when you first come to the club. You're a striker, you're a goal-getter, mm. and yet you have that drought mm. when you first start. You, see, you know, 1,229 mm. minutes of football without Lovely. a goal. How, how much of a nightmare mm. was that? I mean, you talk about you, you were going for a pint with your dad to sort of mm. relax afterwards, so you must have been really tense, really on edge. It must have been mm. so difficult for you. Yeah, it was a... Uh... It was a nightmare, obviously. I think uh, you sign for a new club, especially you're under the microscope massively. I just got in the England squad, playing for Liverpool. They've just won the Champions League. I'm the centre forward. You know, bang, you want to be getting in scoring goals. And um, it just didn't happen for ages. And I think um, what I was des so desperately trying to impress, I feel like I was sort of, Raf was asking me to play a sort of different role a little bit. And I was probably doing too much work outside the box and not being selfish enough getting in the box. Um, and I sort of, once it got to the stage where it was getting stupid and uh, thankfully, like I said, I had my dad around me and, and I'll have to say the fans were, were fantastic with me. I don't think, um, you know, not many places would have stuck, stuck with someone who wasn't scoring, uh, but they could see maybe that was, you know, I was working hard for the team and um, I was an all right lad, hopefully. So I think um, they stuck with me. Uh, my dad was brilliant because he just basically took me out every game I didn't score and, we had a few pints and got over it really, and um, it was back to work Monday. Uh, but yeah, it was a dark time, but the fact that I stuck with it and, and, and got through it made me a, a stronger person really, I think. Uh, and thankfully the, the goals started to flow. Now you, you mentioned the fans there, and obviously we get very romantic and dewy eyed mm. about our atmosphere, about mm. Anfield, about the cough, about mm. all that kind of thing. You've obviously played at a few different clubs. Mm. Where would you put Liverpool and Anfield and, and the atmosphere and the way the fans are compared to all the other places you played at? Yeah, no, it was it was so special for me. Um, like I said, I think I, I became closer to them after that. The problems, I think, uh, in a weird way, it was like everyone else was. I felt like I was getting stick from everywhere. Do you know what I mean? But I never. It was like I sort of became more closer to the fans through that really because they sort of were with me and when when I got my first goal which was an OG probably um, against Wigan the, the, the place erupted you know and that, that atmosphere was amazing I always remember that I remember I've got a video of the camera shaking and uh, you know everyone wanted me to do well and I felt that and I think once the squad just wanted to do well for the fans that stuck behind me and, and, and the players that stuck with me the manager as well so uh, thankfully that that did happen and um, then some of the nights we had uh, were just you know the I've, uh, people always ask me, you know, what's the best time in your career? And that, that period at Liverpool was, was easily the best time. Um, just through the, the magnitude of the games we were playing in, um, I was playing the best football that, that I've played in my, my career. I was playing for England and scoring goals. Um, and that atmosphere on the Champions League night was, was unrivaled. I mean, I really liked in the in the book as well. I mean, I'm I'm one of the older members, if you like, of of the Anfield app, and so I get a bit of a stick for being your dad. Mm. Uh, but I I still like the FA Cup. I still mm. value the FA Cup, and you obviously do. You it comes across in your book, and obviously you won it with Liverpool. Mm. But you told all those stories there about going to watch cup finals, about being able to see it out of the window of where you were mm. staying, and things like that. Mm. Do you still value it now as a player? You are still playing, you are still a pro. Is, is the FA Cup still important to you now and should it be? Yeah, without doubt. I mean, like I say, um, all the stories about, for, for me growing up were about the FA Cup. Um, the European Cup, was as it was then, was, was amazing. Uh, but for me, that was the big, the big where the, the whole world stopped was the FA Cup. Um, so I've still, like you say, probably a little bit old school in that respect. Uh, the Champions League now is the biggest trophy in, in world football, I think. Um, club level but the FA Cup will always always be a massive massive part of English football and I think it shouldn't be disrespected and I think the one thing that I wanted to win uh, when I was at Liverpool was um, was the FA Cup and when I did that it was an emotional thing because um, me and my dad used to watch the FA Cup together you know and I mean I saw him up there and I had the cup in my hands it was for me it was you know it was really emotional so um, and that was you know thank obviously I've, I look at my medal now and do thank Stevie a lot a lot of times for those two goals but um, it was uh, it was a great run and we deserved to win it that year um, and yeah it was a bit emotional but obviously we had the opportunity to win the Champions League in Athens as well um, which I think we should have done um, but the FA Cup I'll always treasure. 
So what what happened sort of towards the end? Then I mean, you obviously you say in the book about that, you know, Torres is almost untroppable, mm. and you, and you're getting less of a look in. Although mm. you know the, the three seasons you're with Liverpool, you're in double figures every year for for goals. You're obviously well liked by fans, which we talked about before. You get the great song as well, the, mm. the feet stick out the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Was it difficult for you to go? Okay, mm. I'm, I'm going to have to leave here to get me football. Mm. Yeah, it was. It was more than difficult. Um, I don't. I think if you leave Liverpool, the only way is down. Really, it's not. It's a difficult place to leave. And I think um, with, with Torres and Gerard, Gerard playing just behind Torres, it was. I mean, he was never. He was never going to be replaced. Um, and I understood that. Of course, Torres was an absolute fire. Uh, the only regret I do have about about leaving um, when I did. Um, was was the fact that Torres left soon after, and uh, I was looking at the, you know the Ungogs, the Voronins playing, and, and and I was thinking you know I should be there still, and I could be there still, um, and it was a bit of both. I mean Rafa, I think um, you know decided maybe it might have been better for for me to move on, and and a bit of the fact that I was still in the England squad and I wanted to be playing games, and I was worried about my England place as well. So yeah, it was a bit of both, but I do I do not that I regret it, but I do. I was finding it frustrating, mm. frustrating watching Liverpool without Torres, um, knowing that I could have been there. What, what was your relationship like with Rafa? Because there's there's so many stories about Rafa, mm. you know, and, and you mentioned about like sort of when he started wearing the leather jacket and stuff <laughs> yeah, like yeah. that, and got a little bit of stick about that. But what's he like? I mean, he, I think Liverpool fans remain intrigued mm. by him as a man mm. because there's so many stories about him. I mean, Jermaine Pennant, your teammate there, has recently brought a book out. He's he, he didn't seem to particularly have a lot of yeah. love for Rafa. But how, how did you get on with him? Yeah, no, I, I loved Rafa. Yeah, I did love him. But uh, I can understand why him and Jermaine didn't get on. I mean, so many, <laughs> so many stories where I remember putting our boots on one day and uh, Rafa asking Jermaine, um, did you see the game last night? And he was, obviously it was Champions League semi-final or something. And uh, Pennant was like, what game? And Rafa just blew Rafa's <laughs> mind, just literally, because Rafa watches everything. And uh, he just couldn't understand how you... Champions League semi-final would be on and Jermaine wouldn't even know and I think it just blew his mind it was two characters from different worlds um, but Pennant did very well at Liverpool and I think he, you know, he was one of our best players certainly in the Champions League final in Athens yeah. I thought he played really well um, but those characters were it was hilarious to watch uh, but my personal um, you know he signed me uh, there were times yeah God where um, I wanted to kill him, he wanted to kill me maybe, but um, he was fantastic. I think he's a fantastic manager. He'll go down in history as you know, one of Liverpool's top managers, uh, rightly so, for, for what he did. Um, but yeah, I mean, getting a well done out of him was hard. <laughs> um, what, what I also liked as well, I mean, you know, long, long career, good career, played for England, you know, lots and lots of high moments, if you like. I like that you know your book is called How to Be a Footballer, mm. and then you've you've devoted a chapter mm. to Gerard, yeah. to Stephen Gerard, and obviously like in this room right now, he's a lot of mm. people's hero and that sort of stuff. But yeah. it almost says to me there that you're you're essentially mm. saying he's maybe the best you played mm. with. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd go, I'd go with that by far. Yeah. Uh, I've been lucky enough to play with obviously the Tottenham days were very good as well with Modric and Bale and um, some some top players with England with the Beckhams with the Rooneys. Um, some top players there, but Gerard for me just um, I think I just feel like he had everything. I remember playing against him when I was a kid at Spurs, and he, he was he was at Liverpool in the youth team. And uh, it, the first moment I saw him, he smashed someone on the edge of the box. He beat two men, and he crashed this shot off the crossbar as hard as I've ever seen a shot been hit. I was like, who's this fella, you know? And straight away, right from then, um, everything about him. I think in England training he was by far the best player. That was in you know with world class players. Um, you know, he played right back and still be the best player yeah. on the pitch. And I think that's, if you put all that together, for me, that's why uh, the, the, one of the chapters is dedicated to him, just because um, I think, for me, he's the best player I've played with. And I'd say, like, how to be a footballer, then go and follow that. Uh, the other thing that comes through as well, and I, I think you won't mind me saying this, is that basically like the, the life of a footballer, mm. and you're saying this in your book, is mm. a bit mad, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah. it, it it's, it's off its head in a way. Mm. And... You talk about lots of different characters and the, the the mad things that they do, the mad things that they wear, but you keep coming back to a lot. Jibril C says, <laughs> <laughs> Jibril C says clothes. Yeah. Jibril C says glasses with no lenses mm. in. And then, I mean, tell us about. We've got to ask you about this one, the uh, the phone thing. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. was going on with this? No phone? idea. Yeah, it was amazing. But like Jib, Jib was obviously 
proper character. But what I love about football and being around it is you've people from South America, from Africa, you know, from Liverpool, from London, all different walks of life, and you throw them all in the change room with a few quid. It's carnage, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I think seeing that with Gibral um, was hilarious. And uh, I mean, so I, go on, just explain what it is for those who haven't. Could go on all day about Gib, <laughs> but um, the best one was I just walked in on him one day, and he's got his phone here like this, and he's got plugged into his phone. He's got like a 1920s sort of phone, you know, one of the phones that you hold, but with the earpiece. So he's literally got it plugged in. So he's turned in, he's turned the hands free into something you need three hands for. <laughs> But he's not trying to impress anyone. He was genuinely... I walked in on him and he was on his own just on the phone like this. And I went, you're right, Jim. And he was like, no, nothing had happened. It's like, yeah, I'm like, I'm fine. <laughs> oh, <God." laughs> I was like, wow, this man, fair play. Um, and then that was it. Yeah, I just went out of the shower and he was still on the phone and then he hung up and just took it all out and then put it back in his locker. So, only in football. So, I mean, how did the dynamics of that work? Because, you know, you said before you were a little bit scared, weary mm. of Carragher and Chad. What, what, did, mm. what did those two make it? Uh, you say? Yeah, it's, it's like you say, it's it blow your mind. And I think seeing those, the difference in characters. But they liked Jim, I think. And he did, uh, you know, he did well at times. He was unlucky with injuries. Um, I just feel like, like, at least, you know, with him, you know, he was working hard, trying and stuff like that. I always remember at Cal- Karen... Uh, Salif Jao didn't see eye to eye mm. for obvious reasons, but um, but with Jib he was he was always good, I think. So one thing you don't really get into too much, and maybe there's a reason behind that. I mean, you are still playing, but mm. have you thought about the future, about what you want to do? Do you want to be a mm. coach, a manager, a pundit? Do you want to just enjoy life? Mm. It, what, what what's the? Have you yeah, difficult. About that far? Yeah, I, I have now because I'm sort of you know most of the players my age now are retired or you know I'm still going. I still feel good, so I'm still going to carry on playing um, for as long as I can. Every person that's retired. Um, that I know has said play as long as you can mm. because you know you're a long time retired. So um, I'll still play as long as I can. But yeah, I'm, I've got one eye on what I'm going to do after, and I've done my coaching badges. Um, I'm on just completing my A license now, so I have that. Um, and yeah, I've done various bits and pieces in the media, which are quite enjoyed as well. Um, but I don't want to go backpacking around Australia. I want to get straight into something. Do you know what I mean? I want to stay in football and be be around it because. It's, yeah, I've been in, I've been doing it every single day now since I was 16. It's 21 years, so it's going to be very hard to to, to just to, you know not be involved. I mean, you, you talk as well a lot about sort of other players and about famous goals and stuff like that. You you, you sound like a fan mm. when I'm reading the book, which yeah. I really love because you know sometimes I think some players you get the impression they're just good at football and they don't yeah. really love it where it mm. does come across that you love it and mm. so bear in mind how you are and you remember you know Rude Hullett's goal and mm. all that sort of stuff mm. what goals of yours at Liverpool you know do you love the mm. most like, do you reply every now and again do you know yeah, yeah. I wonder if they're the same ones that we do yeah no definitely I think um, yeah there's a couple of real special ones from Liverpool I think uh, well, firstly the, uh, the, the, the header I scored um, against Man United uh, to knock them out in the FA Cup, that was a special one, um, just for, for what it was. Um, I think the, the scissor kick against Galatasaray in the, in the Champions League, one of my favourite goals of all time. Um, the hat trick I scored against Arsenal, um, the third one, um, was, was up there for me. Uh, the other scissor kick against Bolton I enjoyed New Year's Day. Um, yeah, the first one against Wigan. Um, so, yeah, there's some, you know, the Champions League goals as well, I always enjoyed them. They were. Uh, I managed to go on a good run that season. We got to Athens, and um, every goal I scored in the Champions League, I, I cherished. You know? Sam, by the way, well, the reason for me doing the hand signals is Sam's an Arsenal fan. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you're in the wrong room here. So you know, just had to get that yeah. in. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when, when you you know you, you said maybe regrets not the right way, but you know, there's little bits here where you're like, mm, maybe with the stuff around this could have happened, this could have happened. You know, you look at it, it's, it's 134, 134 appearances for Liverpool, 42 goals, FA Cup winner. It's not bad, is it? No, <laughs> listen, I'm so pleased with my time at Liverpool. Could it have been better? Yeah, because, you know, I could have stayed for 10 years. Um, I, I, you know, I wish I, had, I did. Um, but the Champions League um, final as well, that still wrangles with me. I still feel like we should have won that. I feel like we just didn't go for it. I think that we were a better team than then. And I think if we'd have just gone for them, I think we could have we could have you know added to to the to the European Cups that we already got. So that was frustrating. Um, but God, the, most of it was 
was was magical. Who are you still mates with? Still, so every now and then I see or see Cara around Stevie as well. Um, Pepe Rainer actually, I spoke to him recently. Um, obviously out in Milan, he asked for a book, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> he did, yeah. So I dedicated one to him and sent it to him the other day. Uh, Luis Garcia got in touch as well. Really? Uh, yeah, Jean, John Arnaris, I did he a man. Still speak to a lot. Uh, love Diddy, like one of the best. I'm sure you've, you've had him on here and he's yeah. class. So um, yeah, love Diddy as well. But yeah, so quite a few. I liked as well that um, because he's one that I think we all like and we mm. think maybe he doesn't get a mention too much, but you mentioned quite a few times. Mm. You seem to really like playing with Steve Finn. Oh, I love him, yeah, yeah. I mean, me and Finn, because um, when I moved up to Liverpool, I had uh, obviously one mate who was a scouser I've known for years uh, from height, and he was a good pal of mine, so I used to go around to his quite a bit. Uh, but other than that, I only really knew Steve Finn, and um, he was from London, and uh, we just got on great. and. Um, he, he didn't drink, so after games he used to take me everywhere and nice I used to have a few, it was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he used to assist me on and off the pitch. <laughs> but he's, he was underrated though, wasn't he? You say, you, say, yeah. you, you know, no one really yeah. ever, gets the, mm. ever got the better of him, did they? Never, honestly, I genuinely think that. I think it was a time where he was one of the best right-backs around. Because um, he was so, so sort of unassuming and people didn't really... Um, didn't think of him much just because he, he did his job and that was it he wasn't interested in anything else um, but he was such a good player and he was the first name on the team sheet and uh, you know he played in some big games for Liverpool um, and I think yeah he probably goes under the radar a little bit but he was a, he was a good pal of mine when, when, when I was at Liverpool and um, like what a good player like, like I say Ronaldo the, the, all the top wingers never got the better of him and he'd always set me up for a goal always great cross for the ball Peter, uh, thanks very much for your time. Mm. Good luck with the book. It is Thank a great you. read. And uh, if, you're, if you're looking for a book to read, looking for a book for Crimbo, all that kind of stuff, uh, we're definitely g- giving the big thumbs up to Peter, uh, Peter Couch's book. So get on that, read it. Hope you've enjoyed the interview. That's been the Anfield Wrap.